have a true environmental solution on that particular border. So far, we do not know how this money is spent. It is wrong. This is, this is indeed the right approach to take on this particular, on this particular problem. I yield back, Madam, Madam Chairman. The, the well, gentleman from you. If I have, how, may I inquire just how much time I have left? You have one minute and 30 seconds. I'll give you 30 seconds if you'd like to, sir. The gentleman has, has raised the issue of accountability, so I, I'd like to call his attention to uh, uh, Section D on, on page 90 and, and, and ask him um, uh, for his assessment of this. We, we worked this out carefully, as I said earlier, worked it out with the chairman uh, in, a, in a cooperative way. And it addresses directly the uh, question of accountability. The Secretary of the Interior, in consultation with the Secretary of Homeland Security, shall submit to the Committee on Appropriations of the Senate and the House of Representatives not later than 15 days before any proposed transfer under this section an expenditure plan that describes in detail the actions proposed to be taken with the amounts transferred. Does that not um, meet this, the gentleman's standards of accountability? The, the gentleman if, from North Carolina's time has expired. If the I could spend 30 seconds to answer that particular question. It sounds it nice on paper, but it doesn't work in reality. You do not know where that money is being spent. The mitigation money is not going to the area where the mitigation needs to be gone. And once again, I will tell you, if you care about that environment and you want to solve the mitigation effort, put the money into the Border Patrol, not into this slush fund to move money from Homeland Security into Interior for the acquisition of land and property. It is, it is unrealistic. The gentleman from Utah's time has expired. Any objection? The, the gentleman from, without objection, the gentleman, the gentleman from Utah. Yield. No. Well, is, no. On. I got you. No. Just no minute. Okay. Okay. You got 30 seconds. Go for it. Here's <laughs> what I think we should do. Why not do both? Stop all the illegal immigrants coming across, which would make a big improvement in the environment in the, that area, but also do the mitigation to protect the species in that part of the country. We can do them both. We don't have to be limited to one or another. The gentleman raises a false choice. If I, if I could claim back my last 30 seconds, and I'll try and do this as quickly as I can, that should be the role of the interior appropriations because there is no oversight that takes place here. We have already been, been berated on how little we are spending on homeland security. Spend homeland security money on homeland security. Do not create a slush fund that we have created in the past so money goes to interior. If you want to do it, cut more you want to do it, go security. to interior where the money should be spent in the first place and do it the right way. Apparently the I'm yielding back my time, time Madam Chair. Time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Alabama ri uh, rise? Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Chair. I, I, I want to thank the uh, gentlelady uh, from Wyoming for strike working with us on this issue. Wait, does the gentleman move to strike the last word? I move to strike the last word. The gentleman's recognized for five minutes. I want to uh, thank the gentlelady from Wyoming for uh, working with us on this issue, and I appreciate the concerns that she has raised and also that the uh, gentleman from uh, Utah has raised. The committee has a attempted to address both to address both the requests of the Department of Homeland Security and the interests of the number of members on both sides of the aisle in drafting Section uh, 547. It was narrowly tailored to address only the most necessary environmental mitigation activities directly related to border security, construction, operation, and maintenance. It included strict controls on the transfer of funds from the Department of Homeland Security to the Department of Interior. Only where the Secretary of Homeland Security certifies that the transfer is absolutely necessary for border security and that the Department of Homeland Security does not have the authority to carry out the necessary activities. Uh, further, the Secretary of Interior must provide a detailed spend plan with advance notification, allowing the committee to reject the plan. The committee's interest was a uh, border security. Unfortunately, we were not able to balance the views and the uh, viewpoints and the concerns to find a compromise in this process. And for that reason, uh, I support uh, the Loomis Amendment and I yield back the balance of my time. Does the gentleman from Texas rise? Move to strike the last word. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Federal uh, public lands leave, have become uh, the chosen path for drug smugglers and illegals entering our United States of America. The Government Accountability Office has confirmed that certain environmental laws 
such as the Wilderness Act and Endangered Species Act, limit the Border Patrol's access and expose great areas of the border to significant environmental damage due to the illegal traffic coming into the United States. In certain areas, Border Patrol agents are limited to patrolling on foot or on horseback, even if the drug runners have ATVs, 4x4 trucks, or even Humvees. A recent GAO report revealed that the Department of Interior is taking months to approve simple permits that are necessary for the Border Patrol to do its job to protect the border. The GAA report also revealed that some per permits are never granted at all. When permits are given to the Border Patrol for such things as placing monitor equipment, the Department of Interior negotiates mitigation packages with the Border Patrol. But these mitigation packages are forcing the Border Patrol to fork over money for environmental activities. The obvious is being missed by the Department of Interior, that the illegal activity itself destroys the environment they're trying to preserve. I recommend adoption of the Loomis Amendment. I yield back the remainder of my time. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Wyoming. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Madam Chair, on that ayes for a roll call vote. Uh, Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Wyoming will be postponed. The clerk will read. Page 90, line 24, section 548. Of the funds transferred to the Department of Homeland Security, the following funds are hereby rescinded from the following accounts and programs in the specified amounts. $20,997,200. $997,225 from U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement salaries and expenses, and two, $594,945 from violent crime reduction programs. Section 549, unobligated balances available for Department of Homeland Security, U.S. Immigration and Madam Customs Chair. Enforcement construction, $11,300,000 is rescinded. For what purpose does the gentleman from Louisiana rise? The gentleman from Alabama. I reserve a point of order for that the uh, gentleman's uh, on the gentleman's amendment. The point of order is reserved. Uh, we'll um, let the gentleman first offer the amendment. But for what purpose does the gentleman from Louisiana rise? I have an amendment at the desk, uh, Madam Chair. Did the gentleman submit the text of the amendment? Yes. The clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. Richmond of Louisiana. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following. Madam, Madam. The gentleman from Alabama is recognized. I reserve a point of order on the gentleman's amendment. The gentleman will suspend. The clerk will designate the other Richmond amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Richmond of Louisiana, page 91, after line 10, insert the following. Section A. In this section, the term covered assistance means assistance provided, one, under Section 408 of the Robert T. Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistant Madam Assistance Chair. Act. Madam uh, Chair. For what purpose does the gentleman from Alabama rise? Uh, respect to reserve. The point of order is reserved. The clerk will read. 42 United States Code 5174, and 2, in relation to a major disaster declared by the President. I request that we suspend the reading. Is there objection? Without objection, so order. The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized for five minutes. Madam Chair, what this amendment would uh, do is, under the provisions of the Stafford Act and, and the Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act, 
There are approximately 160,000 American citizens across this country who, in the aftermath of Hurricanes Katrina, Rita, Ike, and Gustav, received disaster benefits through uh, an error on our Federal Emergency and Management Agency. And what the government is attempting to do now, uh, almost five and a half, six years later, is to go back and recoup those funds which were not gained by any American citizen through fraud or theft or deceit. It was a valid application on their part in which uh, our uh, FEMA agency made a mistake. And uh, Madam Chair, just in these economic times, we ought not as government go back and penalize citizens six years after government made an error that gave them disaster relief funds in the aftermath of the worst natural disaster that we faced in this country's history. So what this amendment does is uh, simply says that uh, the government should not do it and that we will not go back and try to recoup from the 160,000 American citizens that are spread out through uh, Texas, through Louisiana, through Alabama, and through Mississippi to try to recoup uh, those funds. And that's simply all it does, and I would ask that uh, we support it. Does the gentleman yield back? I yield, I yield back, yes. For what purpose does the gentleman from Alabama rise? Uh, Sister upon a point of order. The gentleman will state his point of order. Uh, I make a point of order against the amendment because it proposes to change existing law and constitutes legislation and appropriation bill and therefore violates clause 2 of rule 21. The rule states in pertinent part an amendment to a general appropriation bill shall not be in order if changing existing law gives affirmative action in effect. I ask for ruling from the chair. Any other member wish to be heard on the point of order? If not, the chair will rule. The chair finds that this amendment includes language imparting direction. The amendment therefore constitutes legislation in violation of clause two of rule 21 the point of order is sustained and the amendment is not in order. The clerk will read. Page 91, line 11, Title VI, Emergency Supplemental Funding for Disaster Relief, including rescission and, rescission and transfer of funds. Section 601, effective on the date of the enactment of this act, unobligated balances remaining available to the De Department of Energy $500 million is rescinded and $1 billion is hereby transferred to Department of Homeland Security, Federal Emergency Management Agency Disaster Relief. Title VII, Spending Reduction Account, Section 701, the amount by which the applicable allocation of new budget authority made by the Committee on Appropriations under Section 302B of the Congressional Budget Act of 1974 exceeds the amount of proposed new budget authority is zero dollars. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Madam Chairman, I rise today and offer an amendment. Uh, has the gentleman submitted the amendment? The amendment has been submitted. Would the gentleman specify the number of the amendment? You know the number? I don't know. Only has one in the record. <coughs> number one. The clerk, will, the clerk will designate. Amendment number one, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. Carter of Texas. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Madam Chairman, I rise today to offer an amendment which would strip funds allowed to the Department of Homeland Security Climate Change Ad Adaptation Task Force. The U.S. government has no shortage of agencies dedicated to studying global climate change and its impact. For fiscal year 2011, the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, has a budget of $6.6 billion and identifies taking action on climate change as their number one goal in its FY 2011 through 2015 strategic plan. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, which among other things is charged with climate monitoring, has a budget of $5.6 billion for FY 2011. 
So I asked Secretary Napolitano, why at a time when our nation is running a public debt of over $14 trillion, should the Department of Homeland Security be spending money on a climate change adaptation task force? Millions of pounds of illegal drugs are trafficked across our border each year. On May the 9th, 12 suspected members of the infamous Zeta drug cartel and one Mexican Marine were killed in a shootout on Falcon Lake along the Texas-Mexico border, the same lake where a U.S. citizen was shot and killed by pirates while boating last September. An untold number of men and women and children are trafficked across our border for both sexual and labor exploitation, which is equivalent to modern-day slavery. Additional intelligence recovered from the, uh, Osama bin Laden's compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan, revealed that al-Qaeda was considering launching attacks on U.S. trains and subway stations. Last October, two packages containing explosives were shipped from Yemen addressed to a Chicago area, to Chicago area synagogues, and they were discovered on an air cargo plane. A vast network of computers and operating systems which our government and economy relies on to operate every day is under threat from cyber attacks originating from countries such as Russia and China. These are the priorities that the Secretary should be focusing on, not wasting time duplicating the work of the Environmental Protection Agency and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The Secretary's Climate Change Adaptation Task Force is a waste of time and resources, and it should be that, that those, those resources should be devoted to securing our borders and ensuring the safety of our homeland. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Thank you, and I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from North Carolina rise? Madam Chairman, I uh, rise in opposition to the amendment and uh, ask to strike the last words. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Um, Madam Chairman, I uh, was intrigued with this amendment, didn't quite understand uh, the uh, the, the uh, import of it, so I have, have done a little research, talked to the Department of Homeland Security about the extent of their uh, activities with this task force and, and what the uh, effect of this amendment uh, might be. And so I'd like to offer a little reality check here and suggest that this amendment is not uh, merited. This amendment, for starters, will not save any money. It simply prohibits the Department of Homeland Security and its employees from in any way planning for the effects of uh, climate change. Now the debate isn't about uh, whether or not one believes that climate change is being caused by human beings. The fact is that whatever the cause, climate change is occurring in certain parts of the world. Both the U.S. Coast Guard and the Navy have testified before congressional committees that their operations are greatly affected, particularly in the Arctic region. The Department of Homeland Security has identified other specific climate change related impacts on DHS missions. These include, as you might expect, disaster response activities and the, predict the protection of critical uh, infrastructure. Now, given the historic flooding that's occurred along the Mississippi, as well as the worst tornado season we've experienced since 1950, with over 1,200 tornadoes and 500 deaths, it's understandable that DHS might just want the best available information on climate change. Now, I want to clarify any, any misinformation here. There are no DHS employees, nor are any DHS funds dedicated full-time to climate change. One person at the department has spent a limited amount of time representing DHS at these task force meetings and activities. One person. So prohibiting funds going toward this effort is not going to save any money. But there are several DHS components, including FEMA and the Coast Guard, that have been able to leverage cross-government expertise from the task force on both climate issues and on long-range planning generally. I would think that's exactly what, uh, what they should do. So what this amendment would do, rather than saving any money, it would simply prevent DHS persons from meeting or even talking to each other regarding the task force. 
Now, it's prudent and necessary for DHS to be able to work with its partner agencies to plan for the effects of climate change on their missions. And it's proper and important that our government agencies be able to talk to each other about the changes they are witnessing and the accommodations to their missions that might need to be made. So, Madam Chairman, again, the Carter Amendment will not save one dollar. Instead, it will prevent DHS from engaging in contingency planning with partner agencies across government. This is a, a debate, if it's about anything, it's about ensuring good government and intelligent planning and responsible uh, coordination. I urge my colleagues to vote against the amendment. And I uh, yield the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Washington rise? I rise in opposition to the amendment and strike the requisite number of words. <clears throat> the gentleman to, from again, Washington is recognized for five minutes. I again want to compliment uh, the ranking member for his lucid description of the Department of Homeland Security's work on climate change. We have had a, a weather season that has been a, whether this has caused this climate change that we're, uh, that we're uh, experiencing is caused by, uh, by humans or is it it's just happening. Either way, the Department of Homeland Security should be engaged in the interagency efforts to find out what we can do to minimize and adapt to the climate change. We, and this affects weather. We've seen uh, the storms has been mentioned. It also af affects the, the northern latitudes where the, we're seeing the, the polar ice melting. And, and the Coast Guard is going to have more responsibilities to go into those areas uh, because other countries are trying to exploit this. So I would just say to the gentleman, I mean, if there's only one person working part-time on this, uh, I, I don't see a reason to prohibit it. And I would urge the gentleman to uh, withdraw his amendment. I yield, certainly. Uh, I may have misunderstood, Mr. Price, but I believe he said there was one person that had gone to the meeting of the task force, which included FEMA and was the Coast Guard? Is that what you said? Yes, FEMA and the and Coast And I believe, Guard. aren't FEMA and the Coast Guard part of the Department of Homeland Security? So yes. there's more than one person for sure. And if it's, if it's so negligible and, and, and of no consequence, I don't, why bar it? I don't understand why, why you, you won't accept the amendment. Well, because it would bar the department from even discussing it with anybody. I mean, I think it's, I mean, it, it is so short-sighted. I mean, this is a national security issue. I, the Navy is now looking at the coastal areas. As the seas rise, it's going to affect Navy installations all over this country. I brought in the Park Service when I was Chairman of Interior, the Forest Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service. They all see the effects. We've got a shorter, fi a longer fire season. We've got, I mean, gentleman, gentlemen, this is something you can't ignore. This is a national issue that is significant and to have a Department of Homeland Security that isn't going to look at the consequences of climate change after what we've seen this year is just ridiculous on the face of it. If the gentleman would yield. I yield. Thank you for yielding and, and let me point out that the, I do not ask that the department not look into to climate change. I ask that we take any funds that are allocated to the Department of Homeland Security's Climate Change Adaptation Task Force. If there is no such task force, there is none. I, dis I believe there is, but if there is none, then there is none. But I'm not saying they can't talk about climate change. In addition, you've na I named two agencies that are, that are spending up close to $15 billion studying climate change. You, in addition, named the Navy, and you named other agencies that are looking into it. And, and all these agencies are spending tons of money, and why can't we get information for those people? Why do we have to go off and spend money we desperately need on our borders to protect ourselves from the, the, the real terrible violence that's slaughtering people on the Mexican border? Why do we have to spend money on something that you've named five different groups or studying and I named two additional? Well, I mean, why can't Homeland Security with the Coast Guard and FEMA and all of these organizations be part of the interagency effort. I mean, it just, you, they're not wasting money on this. This is important research. Well, We've gentlemen, already, yes. 
Yes, I yield. Well, the gentleman yield. Uh, I yield. Is, it's isn't not it my actually, time. It's his. Is, is it actually less efficient to shut yeah. off this kind of interagency discussion to say the representative from FEMA or from the Coast Guard simply can't participate? They have to, to reinvent the wheel? I, I simply don't understand the, the, the rationale for, for saying when interagency work is going on and it has the potential to inform Homeland Security's work, why they shouldn't take advantage of that. I, I don't have any time, so I have to well, I, ask Well, again, Mr. the FEMA responds to weather disasters. So they've got to be involved in the task force looking at climate change. I mean, it's just... I mean, I just can't believe the and gentleman no, really I, wants to do this. If the gentleman will yield, because I, I, I don't have any time. NOAA I, is the weather bureau. I mean, that's the weather folks that are studying this thing. But they got $5.6 billion to study it. I'm not asking for the, for the world. I'm just saying, why don't we let... We also, if you'll recall, either last, uh, last time y'all were in charge, took a, a spy satellite or two, moved them out of Afghanistan, and put them over the poles to study the poles. My gosh. Thank you, ma'am. The gentleman's about expired, too, so I'm, I think I'll let... Thank you. Who, yeah. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Oh, come on, Virginia. Madam Chairman, I ask for a roll call. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas will be postponed. There's one, two, three, four, five. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. It's marked number nine. The clerk will read. Amendment number nine, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. Poe of Texas. Madam, Madam Chair. The gentleman is recognized for five Madam Chair. minutes. The gentleman from Alabama is recognized. I reserve a point of order. The point of order is reserved. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's recently come to light that according to the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, the Department of Homeland Security granted deferred action to over 12,000 illegal aliens in FY 2010. Deferred action is a technical term which means that a person is subject to deportation, but our federal government, the administration, decides not to deport them at all, calling it deferred action. This number is, dramatic, is a dramatic increase from previous years. It's much higher than the less than 900 number that was recently quoted by Secretary Napolitano in testimony during a Senate Judiciary hearing. These numbers also seem to be drastically or drastically contradict statements by the administration that deferred action would not be used to provide a backdoor amnesty to illegal immigrants. In short, deferred action is an exercise of prosecutorial discretion, and that discretion is not to pursue removal from the United States of a particular individual for a spe specific period of time. It is only intended to be used in very special occasions, but now over 12,000 people a year are given this deferred action. Our broken immigration system in this country continues to allow hundreds of thousands of illegal immigrants in each year. Increasingly deferred adjudication, or excuse me, action, is being used as an easy way for the federal government to avoid enforcing the law for people that are uh, arrested and caught in the United States illegally. Quite simply, it is illegal to be in this country without permission, and it is the responsibility of the federal government to enforce the immigration laws of this country at all times, not to pick and choose when to enforce certain laws, especially immigration laws. This amendment states that no money from this bill can be used to grant deferred action or parole to an illegal in the United States for any other reason than a case-by-case -case basis for one of two reasons. One, urgent humanitarian reasons or significant public benefits. 
Bottom line, this amendment prevents the administration from going around Congress and the will of the American people by granting administrative amnesty called deferred action. I yield back the balance of my time. Would the, ge would the gentleman yield, or would I strike the last word? The gentleman from Alabama is recognized for five minutes. Parliamentary inquiry, um, Madam Chair, uh, we would like to uh, clarify which amendment that is currently being considered. Amendment number nine. I ask for unanimous consent that the clerk read the, clerk read the amendment. But without objection, the clerk will report the amendment. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following section. None of the funds made available by this act may be used to provide assistance to a state or local government entity or official that is in violation of Section 642A of the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigra Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996, 8 United States Code 1373A. The gentleman from Alabama is recognized. Madam Chair, I uh, insist upon my point of order. The gentleman will state his point of order. I make a point of order against the amendment because it proposes to change existing law and constitutes legislation in a preparation bill and therefore violates Clause 2, Rule 121. The rule states in pertinent part an amendment to a general appropriation bill shall not be in order if changing existing law imposes additional duties and I ask for a ruling from the chair. Does any other member wish to be heard on the gentleman's point of order? Madam Chair, I wish to be heard. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Madam Chair, this is uh, the amendment that I mentioned to uh, the majority that I was going to introduce at this time, and that's, it is in order because it is, the num is number, 10, or number 9, which was stated to me by the clerk as number 9. So it is in order. The clerk has read amendment number nine and the chair will rule on amendment number nine. The chair finds the, that this amendment includes language imparting direction. The amendment therefore constitute legislation in violation of clause two of rule 21. The point of order is sustained and the amendment is not in order. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? I have an amendment at the desk. Gentlemen, specify the number of the amendment. The title of the amendment is Sanctuary Sin uh, Cities Amendment, and I have it as number 10. The clerk will report amendment number 10. Amendment number 10, printed in the congressional record offered by Mr. Poe of Texas. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for five minutes. I'd like the amendment read. Without objection, the clerk will read the amendment. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following section. None of the funds made available by this act may be used in contravention of Section 642A of the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996, 8 United States Code 1373A. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Over the past years, uh, the number of aliens who unlawfully ride in the reside in the United States has grown significantly from an estimated 3 million in 1986 to about 11 million in 2005, and some put those estimates today at 2010 at 20 million. It is estimated that 400,000 illegal immigrants entered our country last year. Even modest estimates put the cost of illegal immigration to just the federal government over, at over $29 billion each year. That is roughly the annual budget for the entire Department of Justice, and we cannot afford to have this continue. Some jurisdictions have assisted federal authorities in apprehending and detaining unauthorized aliens pursuant to agreements called the 287G agreements with federal immigration authorities enabling respective state or local law enforcement agencies to carry out various immigration enforcement functions. And I commend these jurisdictions. However, there are some jurisdictions and they, that continue to mandate that their employees not communicate with ICE when they come across someone that's in the country illegally. These jurisdictions are known as sanctuary cities and are located throughout the United States. 
This practice is against the law, and it is in violation of current law, which is 8 U.S.C. 1373. However, despite the law, many cities and localities still place these restrictions on law enforcement officers and other employees. 8 U.S.C. 1373 states, and I quote, notwithstanding any other provision of federal, state, or local law, a federal, state, or local government entity or official may not prohibit or in any way restrict any government entity or official from sending to or receiving from the Immigration and Naturalization Service, now called ICE, information regarding the citizenship or immigration status lawful un or unlawful of any individual. Once again, Madam Chair, this is current U.S. federal law. This amendment is simple. It says that no funds from this act can be used to contradict current U.S. law, which I just read. This amendment should pass unanimously because it already is against the law for cities and other jurisdictions to prevent law enforcement officers and other employees from sharing information with ICE. All this amendment is doing is saying that no money from this act can go to support an already illegal activity. And it's a common sense amendment, and I urge support of the amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Alabama Madam Chair, is recognized. Uh, I, I appreciate the gentleman's concerns, and uh, this amendment supports existing law. Does and the we, gentleman wish to strike the last I word? I ask to strike the last word. The gentleman's recognized for five I appreciate minutes. the gentleman's concerns from Texas, and this amendment supports existing law, and uh, we accept this amendment. The gentleman uh, yields back. Does any other member wish to be heard? The, the question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. For what purpose does the gentleman from Louisiana rise? Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the, at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Richmond of Louisiana. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following. Madam Chair, I would ask that we dispense with the reading of the Is amendment. there objection? Madam Chair. The gentleman from Alabama is recognized. I reserve a point of order on the gentleman's amendment. The point of order is reserved. Without objection, the amendment, the reading of the amendment is suspended. The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized for five minutes. Madam Chair, and to my colleagues on uh, the other side of the aisle and on the same side of the aisle, as I am. I rise today uh, to do two things. One, it's to thank the American people, thank Congress, and thank two presidents for the assistance that they gave to the Gulf Coast after Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, and even after the BP oil spill. But at the same time, I rise because. Just in the last two months, President Obama has issued 27 disaster and emergency declarations across 18 states. And the fact that this Congress and the last Congress was able to help the citizens of the Gulf Coast gave great comfort to Americans to know that this government would not let them uh, fend for themselves when a natural, natural disaster hits. However, under the policies of this Congress, we've decided that any disaster assistance would require a pay for. And that would leave a large number of our American taxpaying citizens out to fend for themselves when they simply can't do it. So when we look at the tornadoes and we look at the flooding that's occurred in the last two months, and we're talking about states like Minnesota, Tennessee, Arkansas, Georgia, Missouri, Mississippi, Louisiana, I think it should be the policy of this body that we're going to be wherever our citizens need us. And if you look at the fund which FEMA uses to pay for disaster response, recovery and mitigation pro projects, it's facing a $1 billion shortfall this fiscal year. And if you look at the entire hole, the hole is much bigger. You're talking about at least a $3 billion hole for the fiscal year 2012. That does not even include estimates of the incidents and the disasters I talked about earlier, the many tornadoes and the massive flooding that we've incurred in the last two months. That's worrisome, but let's take it a step further. 
let's assume that, or even not assume, but there's a possibility that we would see another event similar to the flooding, similar to a hurricane. Hurricane season started June 1st, and I think that it's absolutely irresponsible for us to tell the American people it's disingenuous, it's wrong, it's sinful to say we're not going to help you if we don't cut the budget somewhere else. We have not done that in the past, and I don't think that we should do it. The great thing for me today, I get to stand up here as a person whose district benefited uh, tremendously from the fact that we have water diversions on the Mississippi. And in order to save Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and New Orleans, Louisiana, we opened those diversions, which flooded small towns, small farmers. And that happened up and down the Mississippi River. So I stand here today as a beneficiary of other people's flooding and other people's destruction that they suffered. And I stand here today as someone who has not suffered a lot, saying the government was there for me when Katrina and Rita hit, and the government should be there for the people in Mississippi, Minnesota, Georgia, Missouri, Texas, Louisiana, and everywhere that the tornadoes hit. So this amendment simply does what I think is the fair thing to do, a consistent thing to do, and something that's deeply rooted in our American history, and that is to help people that can't help themselves. And I would, uh, I would just simply ask both sides of the aisle to join together in unity and let the people of this country know that if a tornado knocks down your house through no fault of your own, we're going to be there to help you no matter if other administrations have squandered and spent money that has left us in a deficit, we will still be there to help you. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Alabama. And, uh, Madam Chair, and this is my point of order. The gentleman will state his point of order. I'll make a point of order against the amendment because it proposes to change existing law and constitutes legislation and appropriation bill and therefore violates clause two, of, clause 2 of Rule 21. The rule states in pertinent part an amendment to a general appropriation bill shall not be in order if changing existing law changes the application of existing law. And I ask for ruling from the chair. Does any other member wish to speak on the point of order? The chair will rule. The chair finds that this amendment changes the application of existing law. The amendment therefore constitutes legislation in violation of clause two of rule 21. The point of order is sustained and the amendment is not in order. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Poe of Texas. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following. Section, none of the funds made available by this act may be used to, be used to parole an alien into the United States or grant deferred action of a final order of removal for any reason other than on a case-by-case -case basis for urgent humanitarian reasons or significant public benefit. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. What is taking place is uh, under the guise of granting deferred action. Deferred action is a procedure, an administrative procedure by the administration that is used when a person is detained who is illegally in the United States and that person's action, the criminal action, or the action to deport that individual, rather, is deferred to some unknown date. The person is released, and what occurs is that person is never deported and never has a hearing. It started, this procedure started years ago with a few hundred people a year. But last year, in 2010, over 12,000 people had their immigration deportation hearings deferred to an unknown date. And what occurred was they were released, and their action against them will never be taken. Some call this a form of amnesty, administrative amnesty. You can call it whatever you want, but those people stay in the United States. What this amendment does is prohibit the administration from using, under the guise of deferred action, this procedure to not have hearings on individual 
which allows them to end up staying in the United States. And no funds can be used to implement deferred action except in two cases. One is under humanitarian reasons, and the second would be some significant public benefit to the United States. Otherwise, no deferred action, no get out of jail free card for people at, on, an in, on a discriminatory basis done by the administration or any of its agencies. And I urge adoption of this amendment and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Does any member seek recognition on the amendment? Chair. The gentleman from Alabama. Yes, uh, we accept the gentleman from Texas uh, amendment. The gentleman accepts. Is anyone, the gentleman from North Carolina is recognizing? Madam Chairman, I For what purpose does the gentleman from North Carolina seek recognition? I move to strike the last words. The gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Uh, Madam Chair, I uh, support this amendment because it restates the department's broad discretionary authority to um, grant relief or deferred action to deserving individuals. Uh, the authority of law enforcement agencies to exercise discretion in deciding what cases to investigate and prosecute under existing civil and criminal law, including immigration law, is fundamental to the American legal system. And since this amendment recognizes this essential uh, executive authority, especially when it comes to relief for humanitarian purposes or when it serves the public's interest, I recommend that my colleagues uh, support it. I yield back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. For what, what purpose does the gentleman from North Carolina rise? Now, chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, the clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. Price of North Carolina. I ask Carolina. Consent that the reading be dispensed with, Madam Chairman. With, without objection, the reading will be dispensed with. I move the to strike the last The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. My uh, amendment would uh, waive certain requirements attached to the uh, fire grants and the safer grants. And this amendment is necessitated by the amendment uh, passed uh, earlier this evening. Uh, members are aware that H.R. Uh, 2107 reduced funding for firefighter hiring grants, also known as SAFER grants, by $255 million or 63 percent below 2011. Fortunately, the House resoundingly overturned that ill-advised move earlier today and adopt an amendment by Mr. Latteret and Mr. Pasquale to restore the funding to the President's uh, requested level. Uh, but my colleagues should also be aware that funding is only part of the problem with this bill when it comes to the SAFER program. The underlying bill also neglects to maintain provisions enacted in fiscal years 2009 through 2011 that allowed fire departments to use these grants to hire and to hire laid-off firefighters and to prevent others from being laid off in the first place. The law traditionally per, uh, permits uh, safer grants only to be used to hire new staff. Now that provision makes sense when our economy is booming and local governments are in a position to hire new workers. But when, re when the recovery is still fragile and local budgets are actually contracting and workers are being laid off, FEMA needs the flexibility to use these grants to keep firefighters from being cut in the first place. Uh, Secretary DiPolitano and Administrator Fugate both testified to this need earlier this year during our appropriations uh, hearings. So I'm proposing a, a waiver amendment which would, um, which would save thousands of firefighter jobs. Right now, the real challenge to community safety is not the reluctance of local governments to hire new fire personnel. It's the potential and actual layoffs of public safety personnel, which means fewer first responders, longer response times, and more lives being put at risk. This amendment also continues provision that waives certain budgetary requirements local fire departments have to fill in order to receive a grant. These include not allowing a fire department's overall budget to drop below a certain level, not reducing staff over a number of years, even if budgets continue to suffer, and providing local matching funds. Again, these provisions are fine 
when local coffers are healthy, but we all know how strapped our cities and counties are right now. So in the current environment, the current economic environment, very few municipalities would be able to meet these requirements, jobs would go unfilled, and firefighter and public safety would be placed at uh, a greater risk. Finally, to address concerns that these waivers have gone on well beyond what was originally anticipated, the fire organizations tell me that 2012 will be likely the last year that they will need these waivers. When colleagues are weighing this uh, amendment, uh, Madam Chairman, I encourage them to consider the intent of the SAFER program, ensuring that we have a safe level of staffing of our nation's preeminent first responders, the firefighters. We've already overwhelmingly supported funding for the firefighter jobs by adding funding back to the SAFER program. So if members really support these jobs, they need to take this additional step. We should vote to allow these funds to be used in the most flexible uh, way possible, the best way possible, to keep firefighters on staff. So I urge support of this amendment and uh, yield the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Alabama rise? I rise to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Madam Chair, I rise in strong opposition to this amendment. Uh, SAFER was originally authorized for the purpose of increasing the number of new firefighters in local communities. A hand up, not a hand out. SAFER was not intended to retire, to rehire or retain firefighters and currently and certainly was not intended to serve as an operating subsidy for what is unquestionably a municipal responsibility. Uh, the Federal Fire Prevention and Control Act contains very specific requirements that local communities have to meet in order to obtain funds. However, those requirements have been waived for the last three years. When initially proposed by the Democrats in 2009, uh, Mr. Price, who was chairman of this subcommittee, acknowledged that these waivers were just a short-term temporary effort that will expire at the end of FY10. Yet here we are today debating the continuation of NFY12 as a, of a subsidy that our country cannot afford. Under these costly waivers, there are no controls, there are no salary limits, and there's no local commitments. These proposed waivers totally undermine the original pur purpose and intent of the SAFER program by forcing the taxpayers to subsidize the everyday operating expenses of the local first responders. Given our nation's dire fiscal situation today, we must take a stand that, is, that it is not the federal government's job to bail out every municipal budget or serve as a fire marshal for every city, town, and, and uh, across this country. Uh, therefore, Madam Chair, I would strongly urge my colleagues to support physical discipline and to vote no on this amendment. The gentleman yields back. I yield back Does to any member now. wish to speak on the amendment? The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from North Carolina. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from North Carolina will be postponed. For what purpose does the gentleman from Louisiana rise? Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk regarding transportation worker identification credentials. The clerk will read the amendment. It's number 28. The clerk will read amendment number 28. Amendment offered by Mr. Scalise of Louisiana. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following section. None of the funds made available under this act may be used to require an approved transportation worker identification credential applicant to personally appear at a designated enrollment center for the purpose of TWIC issuance, renewal, or activation. The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. The amendment I bring forward uh, right now in this bill is...
really directed at addressing a, a bureaucratic uh, red tape inefficiency that is causing over a million American workers uh, to make multiple trips uh, to get a document that their workers require them to have, the federal government requires them to have. Uh, it's a transportation worker identification credential, uh, and it's an important document uh, to have, but uh, it was created back in 2007, uh, and there's five-year uh, limitation and it's got to be renewed uh, and a worker has to go into an office a registered TWIC office and they've got to go and, and put get their fingerprint uh, taken they've got to get their picture taken present credentials uh, to get the card uh, the problem with the implementation is uh, that the department's been requiring uh, these workers to go back multiple times to get the card when in fact if you look at how a passport for example is issued you can go in and you can fill out the paperwork and then they send you uh, the passport it works that way for uh, for most forms of identification uh, but for whatever reason in this TWIC program the department's been requiring multiple trips uh, the reason that this is a big issue uh, for all of these workers there are 1.8 million Americans who are required to have a TWIC card in order to do their jobs and so under these current rules uh, they have to go and make multiple trips and in some cases this isn't an office right down the street this is an office over a hundred miles away I, I have a letter from the passenger vessel association in support of this amendment and they point out frequently the TWIC enrollment center is hundreds of miles away from a mariner's home necessitating two round trips of many hours in duration it is not uncommon for the mariner to be forced to stay overnight during each round trip and of course the employee has to pay for these round trips has to pay for the overnight has to be away from their job uh, and for no for no valid reason in fact the department hasn't even implemented rules uh, to properly uh, utilize these TWIC cards yet they're still making the employees go uh, and, and have these multiple trips uh, if you imagine a state like Alaska uh, where you might have to, to spend days to go get the card uh, and you have to first go spend days to go file for the card then you have to go spend days to go get the card uh, and this this is unnecessary and it's an incredible burden on our workforce uh, and it's 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 something that we can address by preventing uh, the funds from being used for implementing this policy still gives them broad discretion to implement a successful TWIC program but again just like passports or other forms of identification our, our over 1.8 million American workers shouldn't be forced to jump through all of these bureaucratic red tape hoops uh, that are actually costing them money uh, that, that they should be able to spend on their family and so with that I would ask for support and would yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back does anyone seek recognition to speak on the amendment? For what purpose does the gentleman from Alabama rise? Uh, strike the last word. The gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Oh, I would like to ask the gentleman if he can confirm that this amendment uh, still requires the applicants uh, to biometrically enroll in person. Absolutely. Uh, yield, uh, if the gentleman yields, yes. I, I yield time. Yes, they would still have to go uh, to the center and have to apply and in fact in the, in the language of the amendment uh, it refers to an approved transportation worker identification credential so they would have to actually go and be approved because even if they went and let's say they were rejected uh, then they wouldn't be able to get the card but if they went to the center and got approved then they shouldn't have to go back again to get the card uh, so it does require that they would have to still go in person take the photo ID uh, in, and implement the biometric data but it just may make sure that they don't have to go through these continuous uh, bureaucratic hurdles to go get the card. And I yield back. Madam Chair, uh, uh, I thank the gentleman uh, for yielding and uh, based on the, uh, the requirement that the applicants biometrically enroll, uh, we will accept the amendment. The, the gentleman, does the gentleman yield back? The gentleman yields back. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Louisiana. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? I have an amendment at the desk designated as Sherman A. The clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. Sherman of California. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following. Section, 
None of the funds made available by this act may be used in contravention of the War Powers Resolution, 50 United States Code, 1541 et sequitur. The gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. I had the clerk read the whole amendment because it's just one sentence and it's very simple. It says none of the money in this act can be used deliberately by the president to violate the law. In particular, the War Powers Resolution, often referred to as the War Powers Act, which is found in Title 50 of the United States Code. Why is this amendment necessary? Because so many administrations have embraced the idea of an imperial presidency, have embraced the idea that a United States president can send our forces into battle for an unlimited duration, unlimited in scope, and for whatever purposes the executive branch finds worthy. The War Powers Act is the law of this land, and it says that a president may indeed commit our forces, but must seek congressional authorization and must withdraw in 60 days if that authorization is not provided by the vote of both houses of Congress. But this president, like some others, believes that he doesn't have to follow the law. And in fact, in this case in Libya, we and our allies were not attacked, but rather a very important purpose, or thought to be important by the president, presented itself, and so he committed our forces. Now, the respect that the executive branch has for Congress has call, called upon them to hide their contempt for the law. And so they've implied, without really stating it, that there are substitutes for a congressional authorization. They've implied that resolutions by the United Nations, the Arab League, or NATO, is a substitute for congressional action. And they've implied that consulting with congressional leaders, a lunch with leadership, is a substitute for an affirmative vote on the floors of both houses. It is time for us to stand up and say, no, Mr. President, you actually have to follow the law. Now, why am I amending this bill? Obviously, this amendment is even more apropos to the defense appropriations bill, but we'll be dealing with that many weeks from now. And the president has been in violation of the War Powers Act for uh, several weeks now, and so we should try to act now. But in addition, this amendment ought to be put on every appropriations bill that we pass this year. Otherwise, we invite a president who sees this amendment only on the defense appropriations bill to try to find creative ways to transfer money from the Coast Guard account to the Navy or transfer a ship from the Navy to the Coast Guard or the Coast Guard to the Navy one way or the other. We should not invite an unproductive loophole hunt we should have the same restriction on every appropriations bill. Now, if we can pass this amendment by a significant vote, the president will, I hope, request an authorization for the action he wants to take in Libya. And he will have to accept a authorization that I believe will be limited in time and scope. Perhaps it will be limited to air forces and not ground forces, perhaps, it will require renewal every six months rather than being permanent. There may be conditions such as why are we funding this out of taxpayer money and not the $33 billion of Gaddafi money that he was stupid enough to invest in the United States in ways that we could uh, find out about and freeze. And why has the transitional government in Benghazi refused to disassociate itself from the Al-Qaeda fighters and the Libyan Islamic fighting group fighters in their midst. Why will they not remove from their government those who support those who have American blood on their hands from Iraq and Afghanistan? This is not just an issue of an aggrandizing president. It is also an issue of dereliction in Congress. Because yes, we'd like to avoid tough votes, particularly those that divide our constituents, and even the constituents that we have from within our own party. But this is our constitutional duty. The War Powers Resolution is the law of the land. Whatever your views are on our activities in Libya, 
you ought to support this resolution. I, for one, could support an authorization to use force that was carefully tailored and severely limited. This amendment vote is not about democracy and the rule of law in Libya. We all long to see democracy and the rule of law in Libya. This vote is about democracy and the rule of law in the United the States. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Alabama